Good morning. The exciting week continues here at Mount Elim. On Thursday, we had a special privilege. Mulligata from Ethiopia joined us live on Zoom. And it was wonderful to hear about all that God is doing in that country. We heard about 29 new churches recently planted, even during lockdown. We heard of 35 people being baptised just in three churches recently. We heard of COVID. We heard of persecution and poverty. We heard of conflict in the country. But we also heard that God is on his throne and that the Lord Jesus is at the right hand of the majesty, that the lamb who was slain reigns with his father in glory. And he is still calling people to himself as we heard wonderfully on Thursday. Today we've got two more guest speakers. This evening we'll be joined by our brother Alan Davy from Bordeaux in France. He will be joining us on Zoom at six o'clock. He'll be sharing about his work and the situation in France and also bringing a message from God's Word. And this morning we have a message sent by our friend and brother Arnall Morgan who is a pastor of the Waterfront Church in Swansea. You can see that it was a message that he first delivered there at Waterfront, focusing on the Jesus of Christianity, reminding us that actually it's possible for us to lose sight of the glory and and the wonder of our Saviour. And so Arnett will be bringing us back to the heart and soul and centre of the Christian message. And so we're grateful to our brothers for joining us during the week. In the next few days, uh, there won't be many things happening uh, because it is half term. But we'll have a prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And then on Sunday next week, Tim Payne from Kersalem in Gosainen will be sending us a sermon on YouTube. But we'll meet on Zoom as well at 11 o'clock. And there will not be an evening service next Sunday. Also for... The children. Paul Davis is putting on a series of meetings. We can join in. Combination of Zoom and YouTube. I will send information about that later. And if children are well speakers between 9 and 16 years old, there are a series of meetings for them as well online. So plenty of things happening. Let us pray and then we'll sing our first hymn. Our God and Father, we thank you that we are able to meet together in this way once again. And we thank you for the meeting we had on Zoom to see one another's faces, to be able to sing together and worship you. And Father, we thank you for those who have been willing to join us over the last few days. We thank you for hearing from Mulligator on Thursday all that you are doing in that country, for the fact that you are still blessing, that you are still calling people to yourself, that your arm is not shortened to save. And we thank you for new churches being planted, for new life being seen, for baptisms, for people placing their faith in the Lord Jesus, for the training of new and young pastors and preachers. We pray that you would continue to bless that country amidst the suffering that your glory and the joy of salvation might be seen. And we thank you for today. We pray as we listen to Arnald and Alan later on that we might hear you speaking to us through your word. Bless this day, and we pray that you'd continue to help us to worship you. We know that we are still living in uncertain days, but we thank you that you are unshakable, that you are the unchanging God, and that you are always good, always faithful, full of grace and compassion. And we pray that you'd help us to fix our eyes on your Son, the Lord Jesus. As we'll be exhorted in this message, would we not lose sight of the glory of the one who makes the invisible God known. And so would you draw near to each and every one of us and keep us safe. And anyone listening here who might not know you as their saviour, we ask that you would open their hearts and open their eyes to see the glory of the gospel and to see the life that can be given and received only through the Lord Jesus. Bless us and draw near to us, we ask, in the name of the merit the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll sing our first uh, hymn together now, reminding us that God will hold us fast. Who never 
watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Borida, the title of my message this morning is this, The Jesus Christianity. Well, you might be saying, well, what other kind of Christianity there is? Well, please bear with me as I go through my message this morning. You see, true Christianity is rooted in the life, death, resurrection, ascension, abiding intercession, and second coming of Christ. And importantly, his teaching while here on earth. You see, you cannot separate the person from his words. I'm sure that, like me, you were horrified at the scene of domestic terrorism at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on the 6th of January. And I'm sure that, just like me, you were disturbed by the sight of someone carrying a flag with the words Jesus saves on it, as if the Jesus of the New Testament would stand with a group of rioters that wanted to kill both the vice president and the speaker of the house. The Jesus on that flag cannot save. No more than the Jesus the Jehovah Witnesses proclaim can save. Peter is absolutely clear in his writing, in his words rather, to the Sanhedrin when he declares in Acts 4 and 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. Let me be clear this morning, there is only one Jesus who saves, and it's the Jesus of the New Testament. As I saw that flag on Capitol Hill, I thought to myself, in 2,000 years of church history, nothing has changed. The early apostles had to contend with those who infiltrated the early evangelical church with preachers preaching another Jesus. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the evangelical church at Galatia, he says to them, I am amazed how quickly you are deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, which is not even a gospel. Evidently, some people are troubling you and trying to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be under a curse. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? 
I think it's time for us as evangelicals to go back to the basics of the gospel and reaffirm our faith in the Jesus Christianity. For too long, we have allowed the legalistic Jesus plus preachers and the apocalyptic conspiracy theorists take our eyes off the Jesus of Paul's gospel. I wonder if Paul was to write to the evangelical church of the West today, would his words be similar to his words to the church at Galatia? O oh, foolish evangelicals, who hath bewitched you? Now, before we become too hard on ourselves, these extreme right and left-wing so-called evangelicals, thankfully, are in the very small minority. However, they have tarnished the name evangelical, and I find that deeply offensive. I want to read to you, as my text this morning, the words of Jesus himself, the words that he preached to the crowd on the mount in that great sermon of his, famously known as the Sermon on the Mount. And it's his words as recorded by Matthew in chapter 7 and verses 21 to 23. They were read to us earlier on. Let me refresh your memories again. Now, not everyone, says Jesus, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you, even, you evil doers. Friends, my salvation is not found in my assent to evangelical doctrine or to the five points of Calvin or to the tenets of the apostolic church that I belong to. My salvation is found in faith alone in Jesus Christ by a living relationship with him as my saviour. However, while salvation this morning for you and me is all of grace and through faith, nevertheless, we do have a lifestyle to follow after we come to faith in Christ. There is the will of the Father for us all to strive to follow. I'm not saved by my works, but I am saved to do good works. Jesus said that the people will know that we are true Christians, not by our rhetoric, but by our fruits. Now, the big question in my text is, what does Jesus mean when he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, it could be argued that doing the will of the Father is to follow the teachings of Christ. After all, when God broke the silence of heaven and spoke to mankind on earth on that mount of transfiguration, what did he have to say to us? He said, this 
is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And then the Father goes on to say, listen to him. A return to the Jesus Christianity is a return to preach Jesus so clearly that he is visible not only in our rhetoric, but also in the way that we treat each other. James, in his epistle, calls for this balance. He said, faith without works is dead. Let's therefore consider what, Jesus Christ, what the Jesus Christianity looks like as we consider some aspects of the teachings of Jesus. Can I suggest to you, first of all, that Jesus' Christianity has at its forefront a message of love. Love is the central message of the Bible. Jesus sums up, really, the whole story of redemption in his famous words in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, or his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Paul went on to declare that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the Apostle John takes this to another level, saying, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You see, the hallmark of the Jesus Christianity is not our agreeance with a set of doctrinal statements, important as sound doctrine is. The hallmark of the Jesus Christianity is love. Did not the Saviour himself tell us, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love the one for another. Furthermore, Jesus declared, A new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must also love one another. You see, true Authentic evangelicals live, walk, talk, demonstrate, and radiate love, and not just preach it. Listen to how Paul describes to us what this love, the Jesus love, looks like. He says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. You see, to preach it and not live it makes me a hypocrite. And when I read the stern warning of Jesus concerning hypocrites, then I pray, God save me from ever becoming an evangelical hypocrite. Now let me also say, as I bring this point to a close, 
that to live in love does not mean that we close a blind eye to sin and that we don't speak out against injustice. We hate sin. However, we must always love the sinner. This is what Jesus taught. This is the Jesus Christianity. And this is what God says. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Secondly, can I suggest that Jesus Christianity knows nothing of conservative nationalism. Now, there is a patriotic nationalism. That is, a love and a pride for and in our nation. Those of you who know me would know that I'm a patriotic Welshman and will speak up for the rights of the nation and defend her against all enemies, domestic and foreign. And I'm sure that my Scottish, my Irish and English friends would do exactly the same for their nations. However, the Jesus... Christianity abhors what I call conservative nationalism. That is, a nationalism that sees everyone who does not agree with our values and not a part of our race or our color as enemies. Being a Welshman does not make me superior to any other race on earth. Being from the West doesn't make me better than those from the East. Being white in color doesn't make me more special than my black brothers and sisters. What I call the Jesus Christianity is clearly taught in the parable of the Good Samaritan. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus uses the example of a Jew and a Samaritan, two groups who would not ordinarily have any relationship with one another. They would not call each other friends. The Samaritans were hated by the Jews. But it was the Samaritan who saw the Jew in the parable. And it was the Samaritan who took pity on him. And Jesus brings the parable to a climax by asking the question, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? And the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Therefore, According to the words of Jesus himself, true Christianity knows nothing of conservative nationalism. To the Jesus Christianity, the world is its parish. Whoever is in need, he or she is the neighbor irrespective of nationality, of color, of language, or even religion, if it comes to that. There is no national elitism in Christianity. This is what Jesus taught. And this is what God said of Jesus. This is my well-beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God help us to listen. Then thirdly, can I suggest to you, Jesus' Christianity has in its DNA the characteristic of forgiveness. Listen to the words of Paul in Colossians 3.13. The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. 
listening to the listen to the sobering words that Jesus himself taught us as Christians to pray and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Barnes, in his commentary on this verse, has these stark words for us. He says, we must forgive others in order to our being forgiven ourselves. And, he says, are allowed to crave from God only such forgiveness as we grant others. Wow. And, says Barnes, are allowed to crave from God only such forgiveness as we grant to others. Unlike the British Prime Minister, an American president has at the point of his election the power to offer, to offer pardon to individuals that have committed federal crime. Friends, at the moment of our election into the kingdom of God, true Christians have been given by the Holy Spirit the power to obey the teachings of Christ and offer forgiveness to those who have offended us. Tell me, why is it that we find it so difficult to forgive the sin of others just because they sin differently to us. I say without any fear of contradiction that true evangelical Jesus Christianity teaches the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. This is what Jesus taught. And this is what God says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And now my final point, because of time, is this. And there are several other points I could make but I have to respect that joint in your oven and not push your forgiveness to the limits. And so I'll close with one more point. Jesus' Christianity builds communities of grace. The church is here on earth to bring the glorious message of God's outrageous grace to people. Unfortunately, the church very often is seen by many as a group or an organization that exists for the purpose of condemnation. Jesus made it absolutely clear when he was on earth, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't come to condemn, but to bring grace. Truth and grace, or grace and truth, came by Jesus Christ. The law by Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Paul, writing his exciting message for sinners in Romans 3, verses 23 and 24, says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and, he says, are justified freely by his grace through the resurrection that comes by Jesus Christ. All have sinned, you and I this morning, but thankfully all sinners can receive grace and be freely justified this morning by that grace. Hansen describes grace like this. Grace means, he says, the free, unmerited, unexpected love of God. It means that while we were sinners and enemies, we have been treated as sons and heirs. 
if we as Christians cannot proclaim, demonstrate, and offer grace to men and women who, like us, are marred, scarred, and broken as a result of sin, tell me who else can. Where else can people find this hope? God MacDonald said, you need not be a Christian to build houses, feed the hungry, or heal the sick. There is only one thing that the world cannot do. It cannot offer grace. MacDonald then asks this important question. Where else can the world go to find grace? You see, if people cannot find the church to be a place where they encounter grace despite their sinful habits, bondage to life-controlling problems, and lifestyles that are unacceptable according to God's holy standards, then we have failed to show something of the loving heart of God the Father towards the sinner. We have failed to understand the concept of penal substitution and the significance of the atonement of Christ. Furthermore, the Christianity that we have is not the Jesus Christianity. It was the law that came through Moses. Grace. And truth came by Jesus Christ. And we have all received of his grace, grace upon grace. Philip Yancey, in his book, What is So Amazing About Grace, tells this story. He said, A post prostitute came to me in wretched straits, homeless, sick, unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. Through sobs and tears, she told me that she had been renting out her daughter, two years of age, to men interested in kinky sex. I could hardly bear hearing her sordid story. For one thing, it made me legally liable. I'm required to report, required to report cases of child abuse. I had no idea what to say to the woman. At last, I asked her, if she had thought of going to a church for help. I will never, he says, forgive, forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she cried. Why would I go there? I already feel terrible about myself. They just make me worse. Then Yancey reminds us in the book that women, much like this prostitute, fled towards Jesus and not away from him. The worse a person felt about himself, the more likely he saw Jesus as a refuge. And he goes on to ask the question, has the church, I wonder, lost that gift? An evangelical church, as God intended it to be, must be a community of grace. In coming to church, people must always find in every visit and encounter in every visit grace. I would go as far as to say, this grace should be so dynamic that it compels people to tell others of its discovery. Listen, God has been so gracious to us. Every true Christian is unique, unrepeatable, and an eternal part of God's grace story. This is the kind of evangelical church that Jesus is building. And I want to be a part of it. 
And I trust that you with me this morning want to be a part of it. This is what God says. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Let me remind you again of the words of Jesus. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform miracles? Then I will tell them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. I want to follow the Jesus of the New Testament and not the Jesus on the flag outside the Capitol building on January the 6th. Sorry I've taken a bit longer than normal this morning, but I've held this so heavily upon my heart. We need to ditch the legalism and embrace grace and the Jesus of the New Testament. It's time for us as evangelicals to raise our flag. And on that flag, the prayer of George Jackson written, I want, dear Lord, a heart that's true and clean, a sunlit heart with not a cloud between, a heart like thine, a heart divine, a heart as white as snow on me, dear Lord, a heart like this bestow. I want, dear Lord, a love that cares for all. A deep, strong love that answers every call. A love like thine, a love divine, a, life, a love to come and go. On me, dear Lord, a love like this bestow. Thank you for listening. Please take this message in the grace that comes with it. Jesus, Christianity. God bless you. Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord, will be saved. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us turn to him today for our eternal salvation and for his glory and honour. Amen.